All right then, English three students. Today we're gonna read The End of Something by Ernest Hemingway. I'm gonna bring up a couple things going into this that hopefully will be helpful for uh, your comprehension of the story, but also uh, to help you complete task five and also to help you complete task five in a meaningful way. So I wanna point just a couple things out to you. Remember task five is author's style, analyzing author's style. And the real focus of it is on word choice, right? Specific word choice. So any moment where you feel like the author could have chosen one of six words, but they chose one word that you're just like, oh man, I feel that. And some of you guys are really nailing this. Uh, so my best advice for author's style probably overall is a just read the story don't be searching for words while you read the story and all these stories are, are quite short as well so just read the story then ask yourself how do i feel about this story a lot of you guys i give you feedback on canvas right and i'm always like dude you didn't even mention the end of the story uh so i don't really know what your reaction is to this um you've got to start with some sort of emotional reaction to the story and then you can work backward from that emotional reaction and say, man, are there like specific words? Are there specific phrases in this story that help build that feeling I have? So we always come back to the lottery, which is uh, very commonly read among you guys and is like a famous horrifying story, right? You get to the end of the lottery. Well, early in the lottery, you feel like it's a happy little town, right? So if you just stopped there and you were like, Oh man, based on this first paragraph, the lottery seems like a delightful story about this charming small town. I bet everybody here is just so happy and I don't even need to read the rest of the story. Well, clearly by the end of it, and clearly through some strong word choice, such as they were quote, upon her at the end of the story, that's so scary. Uh, you are left with a very different sense of what the lottery is and what it means by the end. And that's really just through specific word choice, but you have to start by just let yourself experience the story. Let it into your heart and your head and then ask yourself how I feel and work backward from there. With this particular story, The End of Something by Ernest Hemingway, one of the most renowned authors in American history, a favorite of mine, he uses very short, direct language that I just adore and I love. And he talks about things that seem to matter to me on an emotional level. Uh, he also talks about fishing a lot and I've not really ever fished in my life, but on an emotional level, this dude hits on some things that, that really matter to me. Um, okay, as we dive into the end of something, I'm gonna point out to you that you can even analyze uh, word choice in titles right? A lot of you guys have done great work with Today Will Be a Quiet Day. That's among your greeting choices by the author Amy Hempel. Love it. And a lot of you really get into that word quiet. What does it actually mean within that story? I'm loving all the work that you guys are doing with that story. So the end of something, that's a hardcore title, right? The word something. If you wanted to analyze that, I bet you could. End is a pretty intense word too. Something. Something is... Something's almost everything, right? Whoa, what a choice. Uh, okay, a couple other things beyond that. This story takes place in Western Michigan. And uh, let me show you. Probably way better ways to do this, but let me draw you a little diagram of Western Michigan as I know it. So... I'll show you in just a sec. Here comes Western Michigan. We're going up the coast. And there's a big bay there. There's a bigger bay there. Up and around, whatever. Okay. Ah, let me go over it with a marker. This is all gonna be on YouTube forever. Love that. And my dad will be upset with my rendition of Michigan because that's where he's from. But this isn't that bad. Okay. So this is Michigan. This is Western Michigan, actually. Detroit is like over here. Uh, this is Western Michigan. 
and let's call this this right here Horton's Bay where our story is going to take place now I didn't draw the bay very well but what I want you to imagine is that as they get in this boat they're going to travel out around this point here and make a fire on the other side of the point I only illustrate this to you to show you that this is pretty far and this would all be woods especially back in the day white pine woods uh, so they're going to travel pretty far make a fire and something's going to happen I just want you to keep that in mind beyond that the end of something is a breakup story I got no problem telling you that I think I've told you that in the notes um, it is a breakup story a very simple simple seeming breakup story which without fail confuses the hell out of my students so let's get into this uh, it takes place probably about a hundred years ago and one thing to keep in mind is Nick hit the main character Nick uh, he's a recurring character in a bunch of short stories by Hemingway and he's got a lot of emotional baggage I had fought in World War, War World War one I, I believe which is a horrifying war and would have returned from World War One at this point. So keep all these things in mind. Also keep in mind that this first paragraph is gonna be kind of boring. It's just a ton of description of this old uh, lumbering town in Western Michigan. Once we get past that paragraph, it's like all dialogue, it's awesome. The End of Something by Ernest Hemingway. In the old days, Horton's Bay was a lumbering town. No one who lived in it was out of sound of the big saws in the mill by the lake. Then one year there were no more logs to make lumber. The lumber schooners came into the bay and were loaded with the cut of the mill that stood stacked in the yard. All the piles of lumber were carried away. The big mill building had all its machinery that was removable taken out and hoisted on board one of the schooners by the men who had worked in the mill. The schooner moved out of the bay toward the open lake, carrying the two great saws traveling carriage that hurled the logs against the revolving circular saws and all the rollers wheels belts and iron piled on a whole deep load of lumber its open hold covered with canvas and lashed tight the sails of the schooner filled and it moved out into the open lake carrying with it everything that had made the mill a mill and horton's bay a town the one-story bunkhouses the eating house the company store the mill offices and the big mill itself stood deserted in the acres of sawdust that covered the swampy meadow by the shore of the bay. Ten years later, there was nothing of the mill left except the broken white limestone of its foundations showing through the swampy second growth as Nick and Marjorie rode along the shore. They were trolling along the edge of the channel bank where the bottom dropped off suddenly from sandy shallows to 12 feet of dark water. They were trolling on their way to set night lines for rainbow trout there's our old ruin nick marjorie said nick rowing looked at the white stone in the green trees there it is he said can you remember when it was a mill marjorie asked i can just remember nick said it seems more like a castle marjorie said nick said nothing they rode on out of sight of the mill following the shoreline then nick cut across the bay they aren't striking, he said. No, Marjorie said. She was intent on the rod all the time they trolled, even when she talked. She loved to fish. She loved to fish with Nick. Close beside the boat, a big trout broke the surface of the water. Nick pulled hard on one oar so the boat would turn and the bait, spinning far behind, would pass where the trout was feeding. As the trout's back came up out of the water, the minnows jumped wildly. They sprinkled the surface like a handful of shot thrown into the water. Another trout broke water, feeding on the other side of the boat. They're feeding, Marjorie said, but they won't strike, Nick said. <clears throat> he rowed the boat around to troll past both the feeding fish and headed it for the point. Marjorie did not reel in until the boat touched the shore. They pulled the boat up the beach and Nick lifted out a pail of live perch. The perch swam in the water pail. Nick caught three of them with his hands and cut their heads off and skinned them, while Marjorie chased with her hands in the bucket, finally caught a perch, cut its head off, and skinned it. Nick looked at her fish. 
You don't want to take the ventral fin out, he said. It'll be all right for bait, but it's better with the ventral fin in. He hooked each of the skin perched through the tail. There were two hooks attached to a leader on each rod. Then Marjorie rowed the boat out over the channel bank, holding the line in her teeth and looking toward Nick, who stood on the shore holding the rod and letting the line run out from the reel. That's about right, he called. Should I let it drop? Marjorie called back, holding the line in her hand. Sure, let it go. Marjorie dropped the line overboard and watched the baits go down through the water. She came in with the boat and ran the second line out the same way. Each time, Nick set a heavy slab of driftwood across the butt of the rod to hold it solid and propped it up at an angle with a small slab. He reeled in the slack line so the line ran taut out to where the bait rested on the sandy floor of the channel and set the click on the reel. When a trout feeding on the bottom took the bait, it would run with it, taking line out of the reel in a rush and making the reel sing with the click on. Marjorie rowed up the point a little way so she would not disturb the line. She pulled hard on the oars and the boat went up the beach. Little waves came in with it. Marjorie stepped out of the boat and Nick pulled the boat high up the beach. What's the matter, Nick? Marjorie asked. I don't know, Nick said, getting wood for a fire. They made a fire with driftwood. Marjorie went to the boat and brought a blanket. The evening breeze blew the smoke toward the point, so Marjorie spread the blanket out between the fire and the lake. Marjorie sat on the blanket with her back to the fire and waited for Nick. He came over and sat down beside her on the blanket. In back of them was the close second growth timber of the point, and in front was the bay with the mouth of Horton's Creek. It was not quite dark. The firelight went as far as the water. They could both see the two steel rods at an angle over the dark water. The fire glinted on the reels. Marjorie unpacked the basket of supper. I don't feel like eating, said Nick. Come on and eat, Nick. All right. They ate without talking and watched the two rods and the firelight in the water. There's going to be a moon tonight, said Nick. He looked across the bay to the hills that were beginning to sharpen against the sky. Beyond the hills, he knew the moon was coming up. I know it, Marjorie said happily. You know everything, Nick said. Oh, Nick, please cut it out. Please don't be that way. I can't help it, Nick said. You do. You know everything. That's the trouble. You know you do. Marjorie did not say anything. I've taught you everything. You know you do. What don't you know anyway? Now oh, shut up, Marjorie said. There comes the moon. They sat on the blanket without touching each other and watched the moon rise. You don't have to talk silly, Marjorie said. What's really the matter? I don't know. Of course you know. No, I don't. Go on and say it. Nick looked on at the moon coming up over the hills. It isn't fun anymore. He was afraid to look at Marjorie. Then he looked at her. She sat there with her back toward him. He looked at her back. It isn't fun anymore. Not any of it. She didn't say anything. He went on. I feel as though everything has gone to hell inside of me. I don't know, Marge. I don't know what to say. He looked on at her back. Isn't love any fun, Marjorie said? No, Nick said. Marjorie stood up. Nick sat there, his head in his hands. I'm going to take the boat, Marjorie called to him. You can walk back around the point. All right, Nick said. I'll push the boat off for you. You don't need to, she said. She was afloat in the boat on the water with the moonlight on it. Nick went back and lay down with his face in the blanket by the fire. He could hear Marjorie rowing on the water. He lay there for a long time. He lay there while he heard Bill come into the clearing walking around through the woods. He felt Bill coming up to the fire. Bill didn't touch him either. She go all right, Bill said. Yes, Nick said, lying, his face on the blanket. Have a scene? No, there wasn't any scene. How do you feel? Go away, Bill. Go away for a while. Bill selected a sandwich from the lunch basket and walked over to have a look at the rods. All right, so like I said, uh, I'm really affected by that story. We'll talk about it. But what I want you to start by doing is ask yourself, how do I feel about this story? Obviously, 
how do I feel about this breakup? Not how do I feel about fishing? The first half of the story, super boring. I think it's intentionally boring. And we can talk about that too. But how do you actually feel right now? Come up with some, some strong thoughts on that feeling. And then we'll get begin to work backwards and, and find some strong language that supports that feeling. That's how you nail author style. But we'll talk about all this. All right. Ciao.